to my left, we have Marco Hiron, who is the Film and Entertainment Commissioner of Miami-Dade County. Welcome, Marco. We also have uh, Mr. Gustavo Aparicio, who is the Managing Director of Spanglish Movies. Morning, good job. And from the city we're currently located in, Miami Beach, uh, we have uh, the amazing local uh, tourism and culture director for City of Miami Beach, Lisette Garcia Arrogante. Welcome, Lisette. Okay, great. And uh, our neighbor just to the south of the convention center, or east, uh, we have, of course, a very talented uh, and, and great agent uh, over at CAA. Uh, who is just doing phenomenal work over there, uh, both locally and international, Bruno Del Granado. Welcome. And so before we kick it off, uh, since we are a media conference, we should start with some media. Uh, so we have a, a really cool reel uh, that is presented by Film Miami, our film office. So I'd like to show the reel, and then we'll have Marco say a few words. All righty, so we saw the man on the big screen. Now let's welcome to the podium, Marco Hiro. Yes. So much. Thank you, uh, JL, Patty, for everything that you're doing at MMFM. Uh, you saw what our office does. We are an advocate to support all of you, and we stand in full support. So any 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 production that is happening in our community, just know that Miami Dade County is as film friendly as we can possibly be. We work with our, our colleagues, filmmakers, cities and the music industry to support our ecosystem. So thank you, and once again, MMFM, thank you for the work that you're doing to supporting uh, our filmmakers. Thanks. All righty, so we're gonna go right on down the line here and do some brief intros. You guys can hang out, uh, so I won't make you get up and down because we had a, a situation before, it's kind of like a, pallant, a pageant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but in this case, we're going to keep it panel friendly. So, uh, Gustavo, uh, new to MMFM this year, so uh, just welcome, first of all, to MMFM, and, and glad you're a part of the group now. So excited to hear about some of the work you're doing over at Spanglish Movies. So just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Hi, thank you. We are the largest theatrical distributor at this point for U.S. Hispanic, Spanish spoken films. We distribute around 120 films. A part of them film here in Miami. And we go through all the windows from production of originals, theatrical distribution, SVOD licensing, AVOD, fast OTT, and now uh, with the DSP, with the advertising, programmatic advertising side of things. Great, that's fantastic. And uh, before we move on, uh, you have this really cool clip uh, that you sent over as well that we like to show. Uh, all about Spanglish movies, so we're gonna bring that clip up right now. Awesome, and also hailing from Miami Beach, of course we have uh, Bruno Del Bernardo, who is the head of Global Latin Music Touring Group for uh, CAA. And I've been here 30 years, longer than all of you guys. <laughs> I got to Lincoln Road uh, September 2nd, 1993 to launch MTV Latin, and I've been here ever since, so I know where everybody's body is. <laughs> Good in the bad of the city. So I, uh, I head up the Latin division of CAA, Creative Artists Agency. We are the world's largest talent agency. We represent hundreds of actors, actors, musicians, singers, gamers, uh, influencers, uh, screenwriters, directors, um, and uh, I run the Latin office out of Miami, uh, Latin America, Puerto Rico, Caribbean, Spain, and U.S. Hispanic. So anything has to do with uh, Latin talent, that's where our office goes to Miami. Excellent. Thank you, Bruno. All right, I'll ask you about those bodies later. <laughs> so, uh, bodies, so a lot of action in this reels, and I love it. So let's talk a little bit about the action of what Miami-Dade is. Uh, you know, how vibrant right now, I'll throw this to you, Marco, is our local film community? Uh, and and sort of what, what are some of the highlights? Well, uh, we are in a strike with uh, the unions, so that has put a, a pause to all of the projects that are scripted and, and under the union. Hopefully we do see that uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel and that's gonna be cleared hopefully soon. Aside from that, you know, we are work, uh, right to work state uh, in our office and in Miami-Dade County we have the privilege of having TV commercials that are still taking place. We do have uh, music videos that are still taking place. 
uh, reality TV shows as well that it happens, still photography uh, that takes place across the county. So um, it is a good time uh, for us, particularly when it comes to the music industry. I'm proud to say and confident enough to say that Miami-Dade County now is the Latin capital of the music industry. Uh, all of our major record labels are here, and I think my friend Bruno here can, can, uh, can attest to that. Uh, so we're really, we're really proud for that. I can tell you that as we navigate um, this strike and as the county right now, which is in the process of putting together a high impact uh, industry uh, fund uh, to incentivize higher production to Miami-Dade County, uh, and at the end of the year and possibly beginning the first and second quarter of next year, uh, we're going to be headed in the right direction. So. Uh, it is a step in the right direction. It's never going to be the savior to all. Um, but it's a booming uh, industry still in Miami-Dade County. Um, I know at times uh, it can be difficult for some of the productions, but uh, we're working hard and just know that uh, we are as film friendly and we're in all of our cities, including the city of Miami Beach and uh, all the way from Homestead, uh, down south in Homestead, all the way up to Aventura and, and Sunny Isles. and, and uh, so it's a, it's, it's a good time. It's a good time, and, and we're, we'll get through this. Absolutely. Thank you. Don't forget Hialeah. Yeah. Hialeah. <laughs> wow. Yes, everybody. I think there's a song that shouts them all off. Set that music. So, uh, Gustavo, uh, speaking of, uh, obviously you work so much uh, with, uh, in terms of your company, with the U.S. Hispanic market as well. Uh, how important it is for your company to be based here and have access to local talent, and sort of what do you see as a local talent base here in, in Miami Dade County? Well, for us, it's key. Um, we began our our story uh, based in Puerto Rico, and other base have we said to move to in order to grow and to move to Miami. Um, and just trying to tie, but uh, CAA was saying, and he was saying, is uh, what we see is. The Hispanic market, now we have 63 million people going to 100. 6.1% of GDP, now that was 10 years ago, now it's 12.2, and it's meant to grow. The US Hispanic market is going, it's going to keep growing. They have a vision, no one, they have this, this strategy, which is Miami and, and, and his company, uh, CAA, is just the, the lines are, are blurring between music and influencers. And uh, some of the uh, our talents, we always try to bring a musician into the love feature films. Um, so, what Miami has become for the music industry, it has the potential to become for the whole of the visual industry. Right. And uh, from, um, there are 7 billion, more than 7 billion, which is amazing, uh, cell phones in the world, and there are 1 billion cable subscribers. And even less movie goers. So if you see the audiovisual industry as a whole, the potential for the Hispanic market, not only in, for the US Hispanic, but for Latin, from Miami and to the rest of the world. It's just amazing. So we have tailwind. Uh, the whole industry, our industry is going to grow more than the average, and Miami is poised to grow more than any other city in a pretty world. Yeah, I agree. That's, that's a very good point. And you talked a lot about screens and these images going out into the world. So obviously they said, how important is it for you in terms of the cultural aspect, the touristic aspect, when something is shot in Miami Beach, for example, and those images travel around the world, what sort of benefits do you see in terms of what you do? Yeah, and you know, absolutely, and I always say upon it's, it's through their lens that the world sees us. You know, when it trickles down, it trickles down, um, you know, into taxi drivers, Uber drivers, our, you know, our restaurants, our hotels, so it's our service industry, it's not just uh, the local film industry, but when you come, you know, we're a small island. Uh, we're a seven mile island with 18,000 people. And so we're in, uh, we're in the height, as you know, with, you know, 
with film and we've really seen an impact. We've been kicked hard by not having these productions coming into Miami Beach. So what we've been doing is supporting locally, you know, our filmmakers to make sure that we're still incentivizing, kind of keeping those who are here uh, motivated and giving them an opportunity and supporting those local filmmakers. But absolutely, having these large productions um, benefit us uh, immensely. Great. Yeah, no, you're definitely right about that. And so in terms of, yeah, if, if I may, just to, to your point about tourism, uh, I have a dear friend, uh, Lori Wyman was a casting director of the Equity Renee Mauer, and she told me this a long time ago. I'm aware of her about it, about tourism. There's a show called Miami Vice that uh, took place in Miami Beach and in Miami. That show was then taken and translated into 97 languages around the world. And all of a sudden, this sort of sleepy Miami Beach and Miami became extremely sexy and global appeal. And then with it came everything else, right? And that's the power of this medium when it comes to tourism. The fact that you have reach beyond, beyond uh, metrics. You can't even, you know, if you're in Germany and you're seeing Miami, you, you, you indirectly think, well, let me, let me cut some bags and okay. visit uh, Miami True. Beach. So. Yeah, we we they stop being in the Miami Oh, there you go, Joe. Oh, well, welcome to Miami. Yeah. True. Yeah, but to that, it's even South Beach. People know us as South Beach. Not even Miami Beach. They're like, I want to go to South Beach. You know, correct me. Yeah. That's where LeBron took his talents, apparently. <laughs> even though he plays in downtown, but that was a different story and, and many seasons ago. Uh, and so 30 years in town, uh, Bruno, from your days at MTV to now, how have you seen this entertainment industry evolve, and, and what are some of the challenges on this? They're well, fixed. When I got here, well, we, there was like five of us at MTV in 93. We were the first pan-regional cable television network. So HBO followed us, A&E, Biography, Discovery. We were the first ones. We were the pioneers. The only television station <laughs> in our share were Univision and Telemundo. But we opened the way for everybody else to set shop in Latin America. Miami was known more for modeling town. Uh, Ocean Drive was, was it. Johnny Versace was living there. Ivy Marie was there. Michelle Palmier was there. Ford Models had their agencies there. When we came, we started attracting more the, the uh, I don't want to say the non-scripted crowd, but that's what it became later on. And then, of course, Miami Vice, like Marco said, which is coincidentally premiered 39 years ago, deep for yesterday. 39 years later, it's still seen all around the world, and like our folks who visit us because they love Miami, but it's <laughs> still the most effective tool this city's ever had to promote the city. So we've seen Miami uh, go f in the 30 years I've, I've been here from just Ocean Drive, mo mostly modeling shoots, to what it is now. Could be a lot bigger. Uh, we see tech and finance and all these other areas just keep going, blowing. We need to have film and TV go as well. By TV, once the structure done, non-scripted, uh, sorry, scripted, because non-scripted, you know, Real Housewives and everybody shoots here. Um, but on the film side, it was funny because I saw Marco Sizzle, which is beautiful, but the second takes were Gloria and Andy for Father of the Bride and 99% of that movie was shot in Atlanta, mm -hmm. and that movie's supposed to take place here. Right, yeah. But, you know, we had to spend a whole summer in Atlanta, which was not fun, but it is what it is. Yeah. No, you're, you're right. It is what it is. And, and so, obviously, you know, we've been, Marco, you, you alluded to a program that you're working on right now to help, you know, fix that. And like you said, it's, it's not going to be Georgia. It's not going to be the state of Florida, what they can provide. But at least, you know, to continue it at a certain level so that we can move forward and continue to promote the assets that we do have in terms of our local talent and our location. So, you know, how do you see sort of a path forward, Marco, in terms of where our industry can continue growing from here? So I think um, you struck a chord, uh, Bruno, because it's painful to me when I see, and not just Father of the Bride, and particularly Father of the Bride, because it had uh, Gloria Estefan, who is an icon here in Miami, and the whole movie is based in Miami, but like you said, 90-something percent of it had to take place in Georgia, right. because Georgia has a very aggressive, very robust incentive program that 15, 14 years ago, uh, they decided to make an investment into that state. And what ended up happening in Florida is that we lost a lot of our infrastructure, and these productions that normally would take place here are now 
uh, taking place elsewhere. Last year, I spent a good chunk of my time in having conversations with our local ecosystem, having conversations with many of the uh, foot of our soldiers here on the ground to have a clear understanding as to what was happening. And obviously, the biggest uh, takeaway for us was film incentives. I have the privilege of having conversations with studios, uh, Netflix, HBO, Warner Brothers, Apple, and so on. And the number one question to me is, Marco, we love Miami. We want to be there. The lighting is great, uh, but what is your incentive? And so we find ourselves now, thankfully, under the leadership of Senator Rene Garcia, who was just here a moment ago, and he couldn't stop by to say hi, but he is now the champion in uh, Miami-Dade County for all film uh, productions. And we are putting forth legislation in Miami-Dade County that would put upwards of 10 to 20 million into a, into a fund that would incentivize production and put forth the criteria of what that looks like. Right. As you said, it's not gonna uh, be the savior, right? Uh, we're not a state, we can't put 200 million into, a, into an account uh, or into a fund, but it is a step in the right direction. And I think um, hopefully for Father of the Bride too, or the next <laughs> uh, Gloria movie can be here in Miami-Dade County. Agree. Fully, by the way. Love that. Cafecito in Little Havana, not Peachtree Boulevard, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, it, Gustavo, it's, it, obviously, you know, you work very much, again, with uh, the international, but as well as independent productions. Um, how affected is that by the incentives? Do you, uh, are you developing projects for Miami-Dade County specifically? Uh, are you also looking at the global map as a producer where you can chase the best incentive? Obviously, Puerto Rico has a strong incentive as well, so uh, how can the potentially the independent filmmaking community, which does represent a large portion of our delegates here, uh, able to move forward and make things work here in Miami-Dade County locally? We'd work with... Um, if those project by project, usually the smaller projects are are more very influenced a lot by the tax incentives. Oh, the, the bigger projects, if you work, if you create an original for a Netflix or Google or Amazon, if they want to make it happen in in Miami, we are not pitching uh, a few projects for fun. And, and Miami is. In, it's important. It's a location, a feeling. They're going some properties for the for the Hispanic market, and so budgets are a bit more flexible in terms of uh, what they they carry. Um, incentives are not the only the primary. Well, the first question, but, but usually for for smaller productions, you know, incentives are are very key. Right. Um, yeah. yeah, unless they are, it's a crew or there's something specific, not just related to budget or to general, but if the crew is here or the talent is here, so that makes it okay. It's uh, it's a Maya, it makes it cost efficient to be run in Miami because yeah, the project is created for talent from Inhibition or Telemundo, and the crew is here and it's good and it's cost competitive even without the the tax incentives compared to in Samaria or any other jurisdiction. Yeah, no, oh, absolutely. And so, you know, kind of just uh, dovetailing to that, uh, they said, and obviously you mentioned uh, before that you have a relationship with ULIGHT and a grant program. So when we're talking at the sort of micro budget level, uh, which again, it's not going to be the Miami Vice that's dumping, you know, five, ten million dollars an episode, but in terms of continuing to grow our local talent pool, uh, these are these projects important, and, and what are you doing to support those those types of projects? Thank you. Yes, we supporting elevating telling our stories. Right, right now, you're following Mountain is a local small independent film that's getting a lot of traction at Tribeca, South by Southwest, uh, at Toronto Film Festival, mm -hmm. and the footsteps of Moonlight. And Mountain is was directed, co-directed by two members of the current uh, cinematic artist residency at Moonlight. So what we do, again, because our fund is small, you know, we're a little city, as I mentioned, you know, but we're known internationally. So what we do is continue to support those independent filmmakers, 
Uh, and we also diversified our fund um, right around COVID time. Yeah, there was a lot of restrictions with heads and beds, uh, different things that were requirements that for local independent filmmakers, it really wasn't working. So what we've done, we've also diversified uh, the fund to allow for finishing funds. If you're writing a movie about Miami Beach, uh, you can get funding for research. Uh, we can, we have, now we are allowed to work with other organizations like Relight, uh, and, and it's really just helping foster our local talent. Mm. And that's part I'm glad you mentioned development funding because that's so key, especially for the independent producer, right, and filmmaker uh, that needs to sort of even get to that starting point. And if I might also add, I mean, the, the city also in, it has a vested interest in um, the my thing here on a film festival. So we mentioned around ABFF. We've already invested over $500,000 in the last couple of years in ABFF, just so that you know, because we understand the impact of having such a prestigious film festival coming for our city. So it's also, you know, not only locally, but also supporting those smaller organizations that are choosing uh, our city as their venue. No, that, and I'm glad you mentioned festivals. I did want to talk about that aspect of our community as well. Uh, you know, and, and we're obviously at a larger scale. I know CA does cover the bigger festivals, the Sundances, the Toronto's. Um, how is important is it to have those festivals that are done well, like, you know, say the American Black Film Festival, the Miami Film Festival, in terms of the work you do and, uh, and, and how it can help, you know, expose that next generation of talent? Well, we, we cover ABFF really well. We have about five, ten agents coming in from Los Angeles and New York. We have ABFF. The same with Miami Film Festival. Miami Film Festival, we've seen in the last couple of years, has become one of the preeminent ones, uh, just a notch below Toronto and, and south by southwest. But it's, it's a great festival. Uh, our film finance and our film groups always at these festivals, not only to check out what's going on, but also to potentially sign uh, up and coming clients. Um, so the festival circuit is very important for us. Yeah. Yep. So I think, um, and everybody has touched upon it, but it's it's very very important to support the local ecosystem, and what that is is the Miami Film Festival. It is ABFF, which is a massive uh, film festival. It is the Jewish Film Festival. It is the LGBTQ Film Festival, and so on. We have so many of them. I just did the uh, Dominican. A showcase film festival uh, here in Miami. It's very important because of what you mentioned uh, earlier. We have filmmakers that go on and do the bigger film festivals and then end up getting distribution deals. And that's how you know dreams come true and, and you have, we have the next Ari Jenkins of the world and so right. on. Um, it is a priority for the film office in Miami-Dade to continue supporting. We also sponsor um, the Miami Film Festival. We also through our partners at the Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau support um, ABFF and uh, continue to, to support that ecosystem because we it's from the ground up um, that uh, we create the, the talent of the future and the, the future Oscar winner, Jimmy. Yeah, that's what we hope. So and I'm glad you guys talked so well about the Miami Film Festival. I've, I've had four projects there, so now I feel better about myself as a producer. Thank you for that, guys. Uh, so let's, I mean, obviously, look, we can have a two-hour discussion on the importance of incentives and how that's what really drives the business. Um, but, you know, we have also a lot of infrastructure, Marco. Uh, you know, we have studios here. We have, you know, uh, you, I know you promoted a co-sponsored event for a, a major LED wall stage that just opened in Medley. Media Pro, which is a Spanish company, actually. So talk a little bit about, you know, our local infrastructure in terms of how that's supporting the local ecosystem. Um, that studio is actually the first, uh, the largest LED uh, screen in Miami-Dade County. Very proud that that is uh, here in our, in our county. And as we scale up with our incentive program, and by the way, I, I aside from the High Impact Film Fund program, I also have an incentive program now currently on the books that we're going to be tweaking and making changes because it is too stringent so we're lowering uh, the percentages and upping uh, the grant back um, so when it comes to these locations uh, here in Miami-Dade County that these businesses because the studio at, like Media Pro and so on uh, are important as part of the ecosystem and, um, and, and, and we'll continue to do that on, on our end uh, so yeah no, absolutely. And, and so uh, I, I want to also open it up to some questions from the audience. 
Uh, and I just wanted to chuck over just a couple of more things uh, in terms of uh, the local, the said cultural aspect, and you mentioned also support for the local independent cinemas. Uh, and so, you know, in terms of continuing to build that that ecosystem, how important are these local independent cinemas uh, to our local culture and how we promote ourselves as a filmmaker? They're extremely important. I mean, we now we're down to old cinema, but we still have to be in cinema tech. I mean, I'm a bit down to you know, so I do not follow it anymore. I truly believe it. Right. Um, you know, it is important because I think we have seen recently, even with Regal, Regal Cinema and the only like major movie uh, film um, would be house that we have, uh, and then aside from all cinema. So it's extremely important. That's where we help them through our cultural arts council funding based fund, and we also um, give them a stipend for what their actual their location that they are here in Miami Beach. One other thing that I wanted to mention, aside from just having independent sales art house home, uh, we also don't charge for any of our planets. So if you want to down here in Miami Beach, there is no charge. We don't charge for square footage fees. Uh, I mean, the only thing we charge, we actually even give you your first, like if you want to film on the beach, your first vehicle beach access pass is free. Anything after that does come at a discount. And the summer also, we offer a discount for any additional passes. So when we're saying to come here and we're supportive and we want you to use, uh, again, our landscape, you know, to tell your stories, uh, we're here, not only financially, but we have a lot of well, I, I love it as well that it's there. Uh, but how can we continue to, to grow that? And I know, you know, grant funding is important, but also, you know, sort of culturally speaking, you know, it's, I think a lot has happened, especially unfortunately with the pandemic and how folks absorb content with the growth of the streaming platforms, with the growth of other, you know, everything is a screen nowadays. Um, but this idea of these local cinemas existing in order to promote something that's not just industry was local storytelling and culture. Again, as I mentioned, extremely important. We also, we partner, we collaborate. So with, uh, you know, O Cinema, we give them grant funding, obviously, but that's the Miami Jewish Film Festival. They are non brick and mortar. So what we do is we partner with them uh, to the on-stage program and provide free movies in different neighborhoods throughout Miami Beach, and that's happening, that happens through the whole summer. We call it Movies Under the Stars. Uh, so that's another way to, to collaborate. In addition to the phone festivals that we find through our grant program, those are all showcased at a skitty young facility, which is the Miami Beach Fan Show. So again, if they can be shown at Go Cinema or you know on the soundscape, we have soundscape movies that happens for ten months out of the year, then that's free. Uh, we also help them find a venue. We do um, waivers also for for production fees inside the Fan Show as well. Oh, wow. That's interesting. And I'm glad you mentioned that because just kind of segue to the bigger entertainment landscape. Bruno, and obviously I mentioned the pandemic in terms of live entertainment. And I know you obviously you cover international. How do you kind of see that that business both locally and abroad in terms of also kind of supporting, you know, this idea of getting back to concerts and live performance? Well, the one thing that, that you know, post pandemic, I guess people were so cooped for two, almost two years that we, we are out of control with concerts and events, live events and everything else. Um, the uh, demand is incredible, wild beyond your imagination. And we've seen you know, all the headlines this year, for example, on the music side, Taylor Swift and Beyonce bring records that the Rolling Stones and Bruce Springsteen had for so many years on the touring front. We're seeing that also in, in the festival circuit as well. You know, um, the Ultra here, uh, Rolling Loud, Three Points, ticket sales are through the roof. The one thing I wanted to comment on when we talk about um, um, because uh, I mostly deal with talent. Uh, when we talk about um, you know, productions, we'll be away from, from Miami for whatever reason they move away from. We not only lose all that, but also the talent. I remember when I started at CAA, at the and then Univision used to do a ton of productions here for all the novelas. So we, all the actors and actresses used to live here. The minute they started offshoring those productions to Mexico or Colombia, South America, because it was cheaper, that talent all left Miami. So it also affects us on the talent side. It used to be hundreds and hundreds of talented actors and actresses on the Spanish language side. Now, very few of them live in Miami. For every Gloria and Emilio and Billy and Alfred who decide to stay in Miami wants to make it big, there are thousands who have to leave Miami. Talented people, which is such a brain drain for us. 
yeah. so heartbreaking. No, and like you said, especially in the talent business and servicing your clients, having them close by helps tremendously. Right? Yeah, and, and they, they become big supporters and big champions and big you know boosters of the city. Nobody better than Gloria and Avila to promote what Miami is all about. And also directly on the film side, Alfred and Billy from sure. American Shore. Yeah, yeah, the Cocaine Cowboys, obviously, and everything they've done since then, uh, you know, and and the fact that they've been able to stick to their guns and and stay in Miami and stay, it's it, it's a tribute to them and their dedication to the city and and the few filmmakers that have really tried to, you know, even Moonlight, we commented on that. I think they started rolling camera about three months after the state and senate had expired, and they were getting a lot of pressure from their financiers to move to New Orleans to go shoot somewhere else to just do the couple weeks of B roll. But credit to them being Miami talents, filmmakers saying this story is so important to be told where it happened that, you know, even though they had to make the movie for less money, they still made it here. I, I just want to say, because I, I, I hear everyone and I've heard everyone for a very long time, but I think for me, I look at the glass half full kind of guy and silver lining and everything. And the intention of the Miami-Dade Film Office under the leadership of our mayor and our Fort County commissioners is really to make us a global destination for the film entertainment industry. And although we see exoduses, because that's just the fact, the uh, wheels are in motion that take time because politics is not an easy uh, nav arena to navigate in. But we are working to be a global destination. We are working to try to appease filmmakers. We are working to try to make sure that uh, the productions stay here and that we are uh, that global destination. And that is ultimately the mission of our office. The one thing, just because just, um, we always have to stay a step uh, ahead of the game. So we, we mentioned it at the luncheon how uh, Miami is the undisputed capital of Latin music globally, and it certainly is right now. It's the biggest Latin urban artist living here out of the correct companies, the publishers, managers, producers, everything here. But the one thing we've seen this year, and you have to adjust your sales really fast, but like I don't know Latin urban is not what it used to be last year. Now it's Mexican. It's not even called regional Mexican. It's Mexican. So it's La Bona, it's a Peso Pluma, it's La Bona, for San Regida. That's what's exploding globally now. So Latin urban, which is Miami-based, is kind of slowing down, maybe slow down. So we can't keep saying, well, everybody lives here. Because all those acts live in California. They don't live here or in Mexico. So we have to be really uh, uh, um, awake of what's going on and react really fast because times just, you know, things just move so fast, whether it's in technology, film, TV, music, things are just moving at warp speed now. So we have to really move on it and not rest on all of No, that's a great point. And obviously with, with social media and the internet, you know, have unknown artists on YouTube that become sensations with one song, right? <laughs> All of a sudden, yeah, yeah global super. Like six months ago, Bad Bunny ruled the world. It was everybody said Latin music is huge because of Bad Bunny. Now it's nobody really could have predicted. I mean, we know 37 million of us here in the United States are of Mexican origin. So 65 percent over the 64 million Hispanics here are Mexican. So they're going to tend to lean more towards that music from that side of of the of the, uh, of the hemisphere. But six months ago, nobody could really have predicted regional Mexican music or Mexican music music calling out to be the biggest thing in the world. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, staying ahead of the trends mm -hmm. and the curve is so important, yeah, to keep the industry going. Absolutely. So we have about five more minutes for questions. So if you guys don't mind, I'm going to open it up to a little bit of Q&A. Uh, so to our audience, to our Mavericks, any questions out there? Roar here. On your fabulous tra uh, trailer feed. Um, right at the end, we said uh, we captured two bikes and taxis and did not. So. Uh, it was, so that was a clip <laughs> made for Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Um, or it was Puerto Rico. <laughs> <laughs> but they are different, different, and uh, different locations have different positions. Right, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, and was that last film with the garden you think? Uh, Tiro Limpio, that's Changa, uh, the son of Paul Luis Garbais at Cabin Rex Shop. Where was that shot? Uh, mostly in Dominican Park. Dominican has a very, very aggressive yeah. set. But mm -hmm. just, just to connect and, and to what Bru was saying, uh, the, the Latin industry, the music Latin industry, and I'm, I don't know almost anything about the music industry, so I hope I'm not wrong. <laughs> uh, but I assume it became, even now with the changes, 
but it became the center of of the music mm -hmm. world to a large extent. Not based on uh, in financial incentives. It was based on on a vision and lots of smart people working really hard to make it happen. And it was the right place at the right time. So my silver lining in this group is that the market is growing. The incentives can improve, can be a bit, little bit more competitive, but there are a lot of challenge, challenges to make them as competitive as Colombia <coughs> or Dominican or the River or Savannah. Fair enough. But if the industry is seen as an entertainment beyond low feature films, which is a, an important part, I come from that part, I think, no, it's just that, but uh, I think there is, there is still the right time and the right place to become the center of the audiovisual industry as well, uh, of, of the Latin audiovisual industry as the world. LA is focused on mainstream. That's their business. It's Taylor Swift. It's not Bad Bunny. Yeah. So we just put on the shelf. Shelf Bad Bunny is very well. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so LA is mainstream. Or even Mexican. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes sense. New York is mainstream and probably more highbrow, other kind of productions. So Miami is, it has, still has everything to become the centerpiece of the entertainment industry and make the most of this demographic and economic tailwind mm -hmm. and at the same time of the technological warp speed advance that we are, we are <laughs> suffering and enjoying it at the same time. So it's a great opportunity beyond the incentives. The greatest uh, advantage Miami has in its geography. We are the capital of Latin America. Latin America is a continent of 600 million people. If you think about 600 million Latinos that are plus 64 here and 45 in Spain, that's over 710 million Latinos. That would make us the third largest country in the world after India and China in terms of population. The GDP of Latin America is six trillion. The GDP of the U.S. Hispanic market is two. That's $8 trillion. And what's the center geographically? Miami. As long as we continue being that center, we will have an advantage over Los Angeles and New York and every other city. Oh, that's a great point. And, and as quickly as things you know, may have de-escalated in a certain sense, I think the good news is, looking forward, uh, if we get back on the right track, just as quickly it can explode, right? So we're not talking about a gradual increase. When we have the right environment here, it would, it's literally like flipping the light on, essentially. All right, question over here. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm in a private conversation with all four of you, so I'm going to of you. But this is the question I have as a Miami born and raised person who has always heard about, you know, how the Latin American market is so huge and it's this vast thing. And it feels like unless you're making content in Spanish, which, by the way, I do, but Unless you're doing that, what happens when you're in the ass of translating, right? What are, the, what are the pipelines of, and what I mean by translating, I don't mean literally language, I mean culturally, right? I think even though we all feel a little hurt about 90% of Father of the Bride happening in, um, in Atlanta, for me, and I know I might be alone here, it was the first time that I saw Miami feel like Miami, like La Gallocho was actually in La Gallocho, it wasn't in Miami Beach, and yes, MacArthur Causeway was there. You know what I mean? So what what do we have to do, especially as local talent, who want to be part of the mainstream, because I think that's part of the goal of what we want to do. What do we have to do? What what are what are the changes we have to make? What are the deals we have to make? How do we cross that that border? <laughs> Sorry, I'm very Cuban. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um Probably he has a, a quite a response regarding <laughs> music. My response regarding audiovisual content is look at the market. It doesn't necessarily, if you look at Latin America, for Spanish, Spanish spoken content can work better. I mean, music usually does. But there is a difference 
the English speaking Latinos, if you were born and raised here, mm -hmm. uh, probably you, you listen to music in both Spanish and English, it's just transparent to you, but you watch movies in English. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, you, you, you have a cultural uh, filter, let's say, the, the coding <laughs> system that can, can actually, you can connect to some Latin pictures, Latin films, like, uh, like the, the movie they were talking about, or many other films, but in English. When you go to the Spanish as language, it's more to the immigrant and the first generation and the Latin American. Um, so look, look at the work. I think uh, that's uh, it's an appealing culture from a cultural point of view. We want to tell, tell stories that are universal with with uh, a cultural strong points of of your content. So from your point of view, but universal stories that, um, and the, the language in terms of which market are you looking for? Are you going for the U.S. Hispanics, especially the English speaking uh, crowd, which is younger, more has more disposable money. They can they 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 watch films in probably multiple platforms. Um, or you go for the, for the uh, Spanish spoken crowd in Latin America, which is a difficult, for audiovisual content, it's a differ, difficult animal to cut because the it, audiovisual doesn't flow, doesn't cross boundaries as music does, or especially in feature films. If you go telenovelas, everybody watches. Turkish, no way. Just, no. <laughs> Bad Bunny, no. Or, uh, we were with Asuna, and a few years ago, there were these soccer players, mm -hmm. French soccer players in the Russian, in the, in the World Cup in Russia, singing Asuna's song in a play. It's like they don't know what the hell are they saying, but, but they do it. So music flies. Music crosses over mm -hmm. really well. Uh, audiovisual, not so much, and in in Latin America, um, Mexicans don't consume Caribbean content. Caribbean don't consume Mexican content. Argentinian don't consume the Hawaiian content. Yes. <laughs> so you have to be careful of that. Uh, I think in regards to Father the Bride, because I was involved in that movie yeah. quite a lot. Um, the reason why I think we worked was number one, uh, most of the above the line and below the line talent was Latin. And by Latin, I mean Cuban, Puerto Rican, Mexican, Dominican, from, from the diaspora, from every single country. Uh, we also had um, Andy Garcia was very involved as a producer. So he knew that the MacArthur Causeway is the way it is, and you drive from Miami Beach to uh, Miami via the MacArthur Causeway. Uh, and we also had a production company partner, Plan B, which is Brad Bin's company, and they are very well known to be very um, smart when they take on projects that are not necessarily what we call the white mainstream projects. So they're very good partners, and they listen very well to us. So that's the only thing I can tell you, but, but he is definitely right. And things are changing now. Um, you know, audiences want to see good content, the, the reason why Korean content is so popular globally and nobody understands Korean, whether it's film, TV, or music, it's just because it's just so well produced. Whether it's a K-pop band or, or a hundred other television shows or their movies, whatever it is, Korea just really knows and nobody understands Korean in this room as far as I know. No, you're right, and that's a good point. I think that mixture of authenticity with universality, mm -hmm. that's the magic sauce, right, that makes all of this really fly. And so the time has flown, um, um, just to know, but yes, Marco, jump in there. One last thing. For, from the position and the platform that I stand in, which is government and the film commission office, I think it's important that every filmmaker uh, builds a relationship with their film commission, that they have a clear line of communication, I see a lot of producers here that we've worked with in the past in our office. And we hold your hand. We support um, the permitting process. You know, what, 
what works in the city of Miami Beach and with their codes and ordinances is not the same in Coral Gables or Hialeah or Doral, our office will support the production to streamline the process. Um, so I invite you and everybody here to go to our website, which is filmmiami.org. Uh, all information is there, resources that we can provide, possible filmmakers. We do not fund projects, but we do direct them to organizations like ULAI, the Knight Foundation, and so on. We also have the county's uh, cultural affairs department, which uh, has grants as well. But it's important that you, you do have an open line of communication with your with your film commission and, and uh, have that resource available for you. Agreed. All right, Art Mavericks, thank you guys so much. This is a, an inspiring panel. I know there's challenges ahead, but I think there is a path forward, so we're excited.